we're good to go. We're all good? Yeah. Great. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Will Kostakis. Uh, first off, this is always great for my ego. Has anybody heard of me? Hey. <laughs> I will let my publicist know. No. <laughs> um, I, I did. Yeah, yeah. So that's uh, my book up there. But um, basically, my name is Will Kostakis. I'm a 25-year-old author from Sydney. Uh, I got my first book deal when I was in high school. And today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my journey as an author, all behind the scenes stuff. If you have any questions of what life is like as an author, you know, I'm happy to go into, you know, financial realities of it, you know, um, all that sort of stuff. If you have any questions about what it's like to be an author, I'm happy to answer them today, but I'm going to sort of go through my journey and we're going to, I'm going to talk for about 40 minutes but hopefully it won't feel like 40 minutes. And then um, we're going to break out and do some exercises on pitching. So, um, and we're going to... The big thing about getting published, how many of you would be interested in becoming an author? Yeah? All right. So, and for those of you that aren't, I'm also a journalist, so um, I got my break writing for 9MSN. Have you heard of that website? So I used to, because it's part owned by Channel 9, I used to, I started working on their celebrity gossip and then writing about Kim Kardashian every day broke my soul. Um, <laughs> because the reality of being a gossip writer in Australia, you know, what gossip happens in Australia? Nothing. We don't get any scoops. So the reality of my job was getting into an office at 9am, having a list of, this is what TMZ has said, copy-paste this article. And so the reality of my life was plagiarising, but making it seem like I wasn't. And from there, I transitioned to something more fulfilling. Um, which was reality TV, <laughs> but it was um, it was basically the universe um, poking fun at me for writing a book about re hating reality TV. So um, I, I used to help out with the sites for The Block, Celebrity Apprentice, The Voice, and Big Brother. So do you remember a couple of years ago how someone accidentally leaked the winner of Celebrity Apprentice? Does anyone remember that? You do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was me. Um, so I was I was working from like 9 a.m. to 11 o'clock at night, and I accidentally set live the video that said Dico has won, and then News Limited got it, right? So we took it down at about 8 a.m. the next morning. We'd taken it down, and no one really had seen it. But News Limited had captured the video and was playing it under the headline, Someone at 9 MSN will be fired. <laughs> Which is really what you want as a 21-year-old writer. I was just sitting at my desk, just pale. I must have looked like I was about <laughs> to just neck myself. And just all the, all the managers came up and to me, Will, are you okay? Are you okay? And it was just really just <laughs> the worst day of my life. And so, you know, I had to call my mum and go, Mum, when you go home, you, have you heard of MX, the newspaper? So in the major territories in... Sydney and Melbourne and Brisbane, they have a free newspaper on the trains. And so, in the city, so they give it out for free and you read it, and it's run by News Limited, so the Daily Telegraph runs it. And um, so the front page was, on the MX, on MX was, um, someone will be fired. <laughs> and it was just describing my job and saying, the person who does that is going to be fired. So I had to call on and go, Mum, relax, I'm not going to get fired, I think, <laughs> but I've stuffed up majorly. Um, but yeah, and I can tell you a little bit about that uh, later on, but I'll focus on... Oh, and also, so I quit that job once um, my second book came out last year, and then I started... Are you familiar with the WWE? The wrestling? Yeah, of course. Yeah, so I run their Twitter accounts <laughs> for Australia. <laughs> it is soul-crushing. Um, <laughs> but it, it's interesting. It's all about, you know, and I do a bit of that now. So um, the big thing is... The reality of being a writer is that making enough money to sustain yourself just by writing what you want is very difficult. The aim is to get that split, which is 90-10. So 90% 90 of your time you're writing something you love, and 10% of the time you're writing stuff that you get paid for <laughs> well and that you know help you pursue what you love. And finding that balance is very, very difficult, but um, it's fulfilling once you do. And when you start out, it's probably going to be 90 and 10 the other way. And the trick, it's the same thing that Ben mentioned yesterday, where you slowly, so he was mentioning, he mentioned working in the news agents. So as he got better, you know, the freelancing picked up and the news agents went down until it sort of went like that. So um, you'll find that as you write more and as the opportunities arise, you'll end up spending more time writing what you love. Um, but yeah, so I always wanted to be an author. So my journey started, you know, my teacher read The Magic Faraway Tree to us in year 11. And I sat there thinking, okay, whatever Enid Blyton does for a living, I need to do it. And so I sat there and I was just writing constantly, you know. 
I was, um, we had a teacher called Miss Shoot, and she was certifiably insane. And mm. hello if you're watching at home. But, <laughs> um, but basically, she would, so it was an all boys school in Sydney, and she would dress up in um, sparkly clothes. She had, a, she had a straw with a cardboard star she'd stuck in glitter, and she'd pretend to be a fairy. And um, she had full size posters of Ken and Barbie in her office. So it was really boys' school oriented, but um, it got to the point where you be you believe that she believed that Barbie and Ken were real, and it was frightening. Um, but you know, so I thought, so I was right. I wrote this story in Year One, and I wrote, and so she was my teacher. So I wrote Miss Shoots Boarding School. So I was escaping her crazy Barbie fueled boarding school, and she pretended to have a sense of humour and laughed. This is very good, and I took that, you know, as encouragement. And so the next year, I went into a class. I had, you know, it was a big jump going from the Barbie paradise to my year two teacher who was strict by comparison, and her name was Miss Marshall. So, um, no prizes for the person who guesses what the book I wrote in year, seven, in year two was called. It was Miss Marshall's Boarding School. <laughs> yeah. And then, um, so I kept writing that, and then in year three, I ended up uh, entering Mrs. Sadler's class. And so, obviously, I wrote Mrs. Sadler's Boarding School. And then, um, so I wrote that for a full year, just writing different sequels, and there were like seven sequels by the end of it. And then in year four, I hit a roadblock because I had Mrs. Sadler again. And I tried to write, I was like, no, well, stop. <laughs> it's enough. <laughs> I've read the story like a hundred times. And so she forced me to branch out and start writing different things. And when it came time to year six, I was like, okay, I, I want to do this for a living. How do I do it? And my... My journey to get my first book published started in year six because my teacher, um, he basically, we had wide reading time. Do you have, what, did you ever have wide reading time mm -hmm. growing up in your, in your school? No? And it, sometimes it, they call it different things, but it's basically when a teacher gives you a book for 15 minutes and tells you to read it, and that's it. So um, the teacher's walking around the class and he's handing out this book and he gets to me in the back corner of the classroom and he stops and he's like, Will, I really think this book will speak to you. And I'm thinking, oh, okay, what is it about? Oh. And then he, he holds it out to me, and basically the front cover is an axe. And I'm like, what? What's he trying to do? He's trying to say I'm a psycho? Like, what? And it's like, he's like, no, it's about a parent whose kids are divorced. Who, yeah. No. A kid whose parents are divorced. That's jet lag. <laughs> um, about a kid whose uh, parents are divorced. And they're going, okay, but still, it's an axe. And he's like, no, it will, you'll, you'll connect with it. Don't worry. It was a book called Hatchet by Gary Olson. Have any of you read that? No? All right, well, mild spoilers, I hated it, but um, <laughs> I only read like seven pages. Um, and so I start reading it, and straight away I understand what he meant. You know, I opened it up, and the opening is this kid saying goodbye to his mom. He's about to spend half of his school holidays with his dad, which was exactly like my childhood experiences. My, my parents were going through basically War of the Roses. It was the biggest divorce you could possibly imagine, like... Everyone was being emotionally manipulative, and it was massive. And that was that was my experience. You know, half the school holidays, I have to go to my dad, and you know, and this this saying goodbye to my mum was sort of a routine for me. And the mum was there, and she's like, "Oh, right." And um, before you go, I've got a present for you. And I'm like, "Yeah, no, I remember my mum gives me some stuff sometimes before I leave, like chocolates or something, to make the transition easier." And she's like, "Here, son." have this axe. <laughs> and I'm like, look, my mum hates my dad, but at no point before I went over to his house was she like, hey, Will, don't forget the axe. <laughs> but, um... So I sat there and I thought, okay. That's, and it struck me as something that was really weird as a 12-year-old. Like, that's a really strange gift idea. Like, what? And, um... Obviously, as an adult, I can see, okay, he was going off to the Canadian wilderness, so maybe she meant wood chopping. But as a kid, I was just like... What the hell? <laughs> and so he's about to, he has to get on a light plane because his dad lives on, in the middle of the country. So he has to get on a light plane with his pilot. And I'm like, okay, cool. They're going to make him like check that with his luggage. Like, there's no way they're going to let him saunter onto the plane with an axe. <laughs> Lo and behold, he clips it right in his belt and just waltzes on. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> and I'm like, that's really unbelievable. And I thought, okay, why would the author do this? It just seems really strange because, you know that would not happen in real life. Like, I'm not allowed to get on a plane with a stubble with stubble and a fork. Like, they're not going to let a kid get onto the plane <laughs> with an axe. And, and so I asked, you know, why? Why did the author do this? Because, and I asked this question to a group of kids I was speaking at a school a couple of weeks ago, and this smart ass in the front row goes, oh, sir, snakes on a plane. <laughs> and, you know, that's totally true, because the whole point of being a writer is that you put your characters and you give them a problem. Yeah? but you also give them the tools with which to solve that problem. 
it's like how in fantasy books they always have the magic ring that you know helps them out you know at the end of the day yeah and so I thought okay what, what's the situation why would the author give the main character an axe and then you know the first thing I thought of you know an axe is a survival tool isn't it you can chop wood you can kill animals with it and if you strike rocks the right way it can probably start fire and I thought okay maybe the plane's going to crash and he's going to have to survive with just this axe then I thought nah there's no way I'm like 12 there's no way I've picked what's going to happen and then you know the plane takes off and I'm waiting you know and he's, it's flying normally and the pilot turns to the kid and goes hey so you want to learn to fly a plane <laughs> and I'm like oh no <laughs> and the kid starts flying and I'm ready for it to crash and it doesn't I'm like oh okay and he hands the controls back to the pilot I'm like oh maybe this book's going to surprise me and then pilot dies just full on dies just oh, uh, heart attack uh, you know and then that was it and the plane starts to dip and I'm like oh no and the kid forgets how to fly a plane I'm like oh no and the plane crashes and I'm like oh no and the kid has to survive with just this axe and I'm like no way and I look up and I'm like I don't want to read this anymore I've seen where the author was going before he went there and I really wasn't interested anymore and I looked around the class and everyone else was reading it I'm like okay what do I what do I do instead? I don't want to get in trouble, but, you know. And I thought, okay, I'll, I'll answer the questions that my teacher said. You know you know how we'd always used to get questions, you know, chapter questions in, like, year five. And it was like, hey, you know, what was the name of chapter one? Chapter one. You know, <laughs> um, you know, stuff like that. So it took me, like, two seconds. And I'm like, okay, I've got about five minutes left. What do I write now? And I thought, I know. I'll... My teacher was like, you know, Will, this book will speak to you as a kid with divorced parents. But, you know, I don't remember the last time I got lost on the way to my dad's house in Cronulla and had to survive in the wilderness with just an axe. So I thought, what's my experience like as a kid with divorced parents? I'll write about that. And as luck would have it, the previous weekend, I met my dad and his new girlfriend. Um, so basically, he took us to a really classy establishment. Do you girls remember Sizzler? <laughs> yeah, so it was basically like McDonald's of buffet stations, um, but they had to close a lot of them because people kept coughing in the salads. It was really gross. So, um... Imagine us, we're sitting there um, on one side of the booth. You've got my older brother on one end, my younger brother on the other, and across the table from us is dad and a new girlfriend. And they are basically going to town on each other. Like, um, it is as close to sex as you're allowed to get in a public space. There was, you know, if you closed your eyes, you could hear the wet slapping sounds of their tongues. And if you needed a mental image, it was like watching an octopus fight itself. There were and legs everywhere. And um, you have my younger brother sitting next to me going, what's daddy doing to that lady? And, you know, she's like, oh, Stevie. And I'm like, oh, dinner. Um, and it was just frightening. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to write about that, um, which is creepy in retrospect. But, you know, I started writing about that. And um, by the end of the um, wide reading time, I finished the full page. And my best friend... He's sitting next to me. He's like, oh, what are you doing? And before I answer, he snatches the paper out from under my hand. Then I start freaking out because no one has ever read any of my writing before who was one of my friends. And he gets through, he gets about two lines in and he starts laughing. And I'm like, oh, I'm funny. <laughs> and then he gets to the bottom of the page. He's like, Will. I'm like, what? He's like, what happens next? And I'm like, I haven't really thought about it. He's like, well, tomorrow you're writing page two. And he wasn't one of those people you could, you know, say no to. So I'm like, okay, cool, done. Next day, everyone else is reading Hatchet. My mate's sitting there twiddling his thumbs, and I'm there furiously writing page two. The second I get to the bottom of the page, he snatches it out from under my hand and he starts reading it. And I start writing page three, because I'm on a roll now. And about halfway through this period, the kid sitting next to us on our right puts down Hatchet and goes, oh, this book's a bit crap. And, you know, we're in year six, so we haven't discovered the art of subtlety yet. And so my mate's like, oh, read this! And he passes the story along. And the guy starts reading it. And I'm great because there's an extra kid reading my book. And I'm thinking, you know, nothing can go wrong here. Except every lesson, my mate keeps showing more and more people. And it gets to the point where two weeks later, my teacher looks up from his desk. No one in the back three rows is reading Hatchet. And everyone's passing around this story I've written. And I'm like, oh no. And he was one of those, I'll stand up for this, because it's, um, he was one of those really strict male teachers. I don't know how many of them you've encou in encountered, because they usually are bred in all boys' schools. But he has this, he says, he says gents like it's a threat. 
<laughs> and it's like, right, Jets, what's going on here? But he combines it with a really creepy pelvic thrust. <laughs> and so it's like, right, Jets, thrust, them. what's going on here? And so our reaction to that is to just wet ourselves laughing, which just makes him angrier. He's like, no, this is serious. I'm like, oh, and he collects the story up. And he's like, so what is it? And everyone just turns and points to me and goes, Kostakis wrote a rude story. And I'm like, oh, no, this is the end. And he's like, right, Will, my office tomorrow morning. And I get no sleep that night. I think that's it. I'm getting expelled. This is it. You know, boy gets expelled for writing a short story in class. Um, he invites me into his office, and I'm sitting there, and I'm really freaking out. And he's like, right, Will, so I read your story last night. And I'm like, crap, 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 crap. crap. And he's like, um, and he leans in. I'm like, oh, that's it. He's going in for the kill. He's like, so what happens next? <laughs> And I'm like, oh, okay, that's that's not getting expelled. And I'm like, oh, I don't know, sir, I'm too busy reading Hatchet. <laughs> and he's like, well, how about, you know, you stop reading Hatchet and you finish writing this story for me? Oh, but so I really love Hatchet. <laughs> and he's like, no, finish the story. I'm like, sweet. <laughs> and so the rest of the term, I write this story. And by the time I finish, it's about 25 pages. So... Um, before you're like, oh, 25 pages, remember, this is 25 year six pages. So it's like, uh, <laughs> finger stays a uh, new page. Um, so it was about 10 words max. Um, and so he's like, Will, you know what? Next year, I want you to turn this into a novel for me. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. So I never saw him ever again. But, you know, the next year I turned it into a novel. And um, it took me all of the year. And by the end of year seven, I'd finished writing my novel. Uh, are you all familiar with Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix? <laughs> yeah, of course you are. <laughs> I go to some schools and they're like, no! And I'm like, no. So, um, so for those of you that aren't, it's that big yellow one in the middle. Basically, if you're ever going to kill anyone with a book, you choose Order of the Phoenix. Because, <laughs> like, throw that properly and it would get the job done. <laughs> I, um, and, you know, so we all know how long it was. The book I wrote in Year 7 was twice as long as that. So, yeah, it was that in terms of words. Like, it was, like, you printed it out, it was that tall. And, you know, what do you do when you finish a book that's that tall when you print it out? Do you, one, read through it to see if it's any good? Do you, two, click the spell check button and check for mistakes? Do you, three, give it to a trusted friend to see, to get their honest feedback? Or, four, do you get a massive ass envelope and send it straight off to Penguin? I send it straight off to Penguin. <laughs> and, um,. I, you know, next week I check the mailbox, there's no reply. I'm like, oh, that's cool. It's all right. They're just organising my massive six-figure paycheck. And so I'm waiting. I keep checking the mailbox until I sort of forget about it. And then the middle of year eight, I get a response. I'm like, oh, this is it. And I see the penguin letterhead, you know, on the masthead on the um, envelope. And I'm like, yes, this is it. So I call my family, tell them all to come over. And so I'm sitting at the dinner, ta dinner table. It's about eight o'clock at night. You've got my mum sitting next to me going, William, are you sure you don't want to be a doctor? I have my older and younger brothers sitting there going, oh, I'm so bored. And I have my grandmother who's driven halfway across Sydney. She's sitting at the other um, end of the table, basically. She's looking gleeful because she's got half of Greece on speed dial, ready to call them and go, my grandson's better than yours. <laughs> and so I'm like, yeah, this is it. So I open it up and I start reading. And it's like, dear Will, I'm like, oh, they know my name. And they're like, we received your book. And I'm like, yeah, you did. It's not very good. Oh. Kind of regards, penguin. Huh. And I was shattered. And so my mum was like, See, now you could be a doctor. My brothers are pissing themselves laughing. And my grandma's at the table just crying and eating and going, My grandson's handsome. Um, so I was like, Oh, my book, my book can't be that bad, can it? And so I went upstairs and um, I switched on my computer and I started reading through it. And oh my god, it was exactly as bad as they said it was. So, what grades are you guys in at the moment? Who's in year nine? Year 10? Year 11? Year 12? Just graduated? Oh, okay, cool. Um, so, you know that, you know when you find something you've written the previous year and you read through it and you're like, oh my god, I'm so much smarter now? <laughs> now imagine finding something you wrote in year 7. And now imagine you sent that off to Penguin. <laughs> So I was going through that feeling. I'm like, oh, this is so bad. But I'm in year eight now. I'm mature. I can fix this. <laughs> and by fixing it, I made it longer. <laughs> so um, now when I printed it out, it was twice as long as that. So literally, you printed it out, it was that tall. And I'm like, okay, no, that's something wrong with this. This is too long now, right? 
you're looking at this, no, something needs to be done. You're all thinking editing, and I'm thinking, ah, trilogy. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you make a trilogy, right? You, you take it and you divide it by three. So that's about a third, right? <laughs> Doof, that's book one of my epic trilogy. <laughs> book two, and that's book three. There's my trilogy. You know, it would end mid-sentence, mid-chapter, <laughs> and it would just be like, oh, they've never done that before, because that's a stupid idea. Um, and so, what did I do? I got a massive envelope and then just sent it straight off to Random House, because, you know, I was pissed off at Penguin. <laughs> and so, um, six months later, I get a reply, and having learnt my lesson from the last time, I invite my entire family around the dinner table. Because if you're going to get rejected, you want an audience. And so, they're all sitting there, mom's like, William, you don't have to be a doctor, you can be a lawyer. And you've got um, my brother sitting there trying not to piss themselves laughing too early. And you've got my grandmother at the end of the table going, so handsome when I buy your book. And so, I open it up and it's like, dear Will, we received your story. And I'm like, yeah, you did. And they're like, it's not very good. But, here's some things you can do to improve it. And there were dot points of things that needed to, you know, improve. And my family reacted the way I expected. But, you know, I was upset at first, but then it hit me that I'm like, no, this is actually quite positive. You know, last time I got, D Will, you suck. <laughs> this time I got, D Will, you suck, but here's how you can suffer less. <laughs> and I thought, you know what, that's really good. And so I kept rewriting and rewriting and rewriting until it got to the point where I was in year 12 and I was in the library during a free period and doing some independent study which is basically pa playing video games and the teacher was working. Yeah. <laughs> and so my mate comes up to me and he's like, oh, Will. And I'm like, what? He's like, um, you know how I want to be a singer? And I'm like, no. And he's like, yeah, well, no, I want to be a singer. And when I go to Germany on exchange next year, I'm going to meet the famous music producer, Max Martin, and we're going to record a song. I'm like, oh, how did you do that? He's like, oh, I guess this email address. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, I sent an email to max at maxmartin.com and it worked. I'm like, oh. He's like, you should try that with publishers. And then he walked off, and I'm thinking, yeah, because that's why I haven't been published yet. It's because I haven't stalked publishers via email enough. And I thought, you know what? I'm 17. I think that's a good idea. <laughs> and so I started Googling all the names of everyone who worked for all the major publishing companies. And then I started Googling the ends of their email addresses, like the at penguincompany.com.au. Yeah? And then I... Once I had all of those, I started guessing, you know how the beginning of emails can change? Like sometimes it's M dot surname, sometimes it's full name, surname, at. Mm -hmm. And you know, there are all these different forms. And so I'm like, you know what? I'm going to send off all these random emails to all these, all these possible combinations. And if they bounce back, then I know it's not right. And so it took me about 20 minutes. And by the end of the 20 minutes, I had guessed every single major publishing company email address. And I had the ones that I knew were the emails. <laughs> And I thought, okay, cool. So I'm sitting there with this master list. I'm like, what do I do? I don't have my book with me now. So I'll go home, I'll think about my pitch, and I'll send it properly. And then I check my phone. I'm like, well, actually, no. I've got about 10 minutes left in my free period. So why don't I just do it now? <laughs> so I open up my Hotmail. And so this is the Hotmail that I came up with in year four. So you know those really classy email addresses you find you know, in early primary school? Like the ones with the 69s and the, you know, like like sexy, sexy underscore monkey underscore age underscore yeah baby at hotmail.com. And then, you know, and you know how like in year seven you finally discover that you don't have to actually put the real full name in and if you, you can change your surname from Kostakis to Daman. So when people get emails from you from sexy monkey 69, 1989, star underscore... They will also, it will say that they've got a new email from Wilda Man. <laughs> so this was the email address I sent it from, right? It was the single most professional email ever. Okay, cool. So I was like, um, and I'm sending them all at the same time. And even though I'm sending it to everyone, I know all of their full names, I address the email Dear Penguin. Save that for a moment. So, you know, I, this is the equivalent of Toby's email address. But instead of writing Dear Toby, you write Dear McDonald's. And then you send that email to Taco Bell. So. So. about a group of Sydney teenagers dealing with life. 
And I sat back and I thought, oh, is that what my book's about? And it's kind of not really about anything, is it? It just sounds like, mm, what's the plot? And I thought, oh, stuff, but they're going to publish me anyway. <laughs> you know, is that, you know, that Greek humility coming through. <laughs> um, and I took the new line on it. And there's also serious potential. In the sequel, they get their own reality TV. I really want to write. And my teachers were always like, make sure you always put your best foot forward when you're pitching something. Don't pitch something you know is lackluster. Don't pitch a book because you know the sequel's them six months to get back to me. So I can write the email as if we write it with that premise in mind. So by the time they email me, I'll have the book. Again, again, yeah. <laughs> Dear Penguin, my name is Will Kostakis and I've just written an amazing book about a group of Sydney teenagers who have their own reality team. to pitch and so I sent it off and I'm like great they're going to get back to me in six months six minutes later <laughs> ding corner of the screen so I click on it dear Will this sounds fantastic can you send to me right now kind regards the head of publishing Red House <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm staring at my screen just like what have I done what have I done and so um, the bell goes and everyone's going to maths but I'm just like sitting there like no nah, I can't just tell the truth so I start writing the email dear random house because apparently I don't know how to address emails to people so dear random house um, sorry I lied I haven't really finished it yet I sent the email off too early but if you'd like I can send it to you when it's finished Looked at that email like they're going to be so pissed off. There's no way they're going to want to read it now because that was so unprofessional. And I sat there, I'm like, oh, what do I do? What do I do? And as I'm freaking out about what to do, I get this other email. <laughs> and it's from Pam McMillan. I open it up. Dear Will, email it to me right now. <laughs> if you have any questions, here's my personal mobile number. Can't regard to Pam McMillan. Crap. <laughs> um, so basically, I just sort of make this sound. <laughs> and it captures the attention of my school librarian who if you need a mental image have you seen The Incredibles? <laughs> you know Edna Mode? Yeah. <laughs> that was my school librarian so she scurries over to me just like a blonde bowl cut and legs and she's like, she's like and she just slaps me across the back of the head she's like William why are you making whale sounds in my library? <laughs> and I'm like I may have inadvertently lied to every single major publishing company in Australia and told them I'd written a book that I had it and she's like you effing moron <laughs> and she's like right so she called all my teachers and said Will's not coming to class today he's helping me out in the library she locks me in her office she's like Will write the best first chapter you can I'm like what she's like write the best first chapter and I'm like I have no idea she's like just write the best first chapter and walks out and then she comes back in 10 minutes, reads what I've written. No, that's not the best. Delete it, start again. And she kept coming in until she kept deleting less and less. And then by the end of the day, I'd written the first chapter we both liked. She's like, right, send that off. And then they will get back to you for six months. I'm like, okay, cool. So I sent it off. And I'm relaxed. And so this is back in the stone age before we had internet on our phones. And so um, I called the train home. And, you know, I couldn't check my email because I was on, like, a brick, not the 3310. So. <laughs> and, um... I go home, switch on my computer, and I've got a new email from Pam McMillan. And I'm like, oh, that's a bit quick. Maybe they're just acknowledging receipt. So I open it up and it's like, Dear Will, we passed your story around the past around the room today. Everyone really liked it. Can you come in next week and bring the whole book with you? Kind regards, Pam McMillan. <laughs> no, no, I can't do that. It's impossible. <laughs> and so I'm really freaking out. And um I have no idea what to do, so I, I decided not. Nah, I'm this far down the rabbit hole, I had to keep lying. Just keep digging, just keep digging. And so, I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm doing my HSC at the moment. Can I get back to you just after I finish? I really want to focus on my studies. She's like, yes, Will, your priorities are in the right place. You know, I'm thinking, stuff the HSC, I've got to write a book. <laughs> and I told that plan to my mom. She's like, no, not stuff the HSC. You, you study. And I'm like, fine. So I had to study. And then, um, at the end of it, um, my final exam, I get an email 
from her going, Dear Will, you know, I heard today's your final exam, you know, would you like to come in tomorrow and bring the book with you? I'm like, ah. So I go in with the 11 pages I have written, right? And I sit down, she reads it. And you know when someone reads sort of out loud, like they're not saying the words, but they're sort of making facial expressions and sounds, and like, <laughs> and, then, you know, and then she looks up and she sighs and she's like, Will, can I be honest with you? And I'm like, my heart just sinks, because you know, no one ever says, hey, can I be honest with you? You're awesome. <laughs> it's always, hey, can I be honest with you? You're a shithouse. Like, I mean, <laughs> that's, that's basically how it always works. And so I'm like, yeah, she's like, look, Will, it's not as good as the first chapters you sent. I'm like, oh, really? She's like, no, it's not as good. I'm like, oh, damn it. See, I, I stuffed up my chance. I should have just told the truth. She's like, but you know what? We really love that first chapter. So how about we give you some money and a year and you write this book for us and then we release it next year? And I sat back and I thought, oh, okay, yeah, that sounds great. And so I signed the book deal and I spent the next year writing the book and then it came out in my second year of university when I was 19. So basically the moral of the story is lie and cheat and you too can achieve all of your dreams <laughs> no the real moral of the story is that look um you never know when that door's going to open and you're going to get your chance i was incredibly lucky and now they've stopped allowing people to just email publishers like that's not allowed anymore mostly because they ask me how i did it i'm like oh i just guessed your email addresses and they're just like <laughs> and so they changed their junk mail filters and stuff um but also, the main reason why I got to that point was because, you know, I wasn't ready the first time I sent the book off in year 11, in year 7. I wasn't ready when I sent it off again at the end of year 8. I wasn't ready when I sent them off in year 9 and year 10. But I kept getting better and better. And the trick was to not let it get to me when I was rejected, but to ask myself, why was I rejected and how can I improve? Because the thing is, you never know when that door is going to open for you. It opened for me when I was 17. It opens for other people when they're 12 or when they're 30 or when they're 25. The trick is to be in the best place possible when that opportunity arises. So keep trying, keep persevering, and don't <coughs> be disheartened if you suffer a setback. Because setbacks are good. You know, for me, the ultimate goal was to get published. But that was in 2008. And I asked everyone in this room in 2014 if you know who I am. And you said no. So um, that's the thing. So that wasn't the end of my journey. And, you know, five years later, I released my second book. And <laughs> that did considerably better than my first book. And so um, it's just... And if you ask me now, I wish... And every, every author always says that they wish that their first book never came out. Because, you know, publishers always say, you know, ideally the best thing possible would be to go through the entire publishing experience from... Um, pitching to writing to editing to releasing and then not actually release it so you get all that practice and then you can write your better second book yeah but because of the emo the, um, the economic investment that they place in your first book they have to still release it um, so when I look back at it now I cringe because I have a book that I wrote at 17 in bookstores and I read it I'm like oh that's really terrible so um, so it's not I know that the one thing that I wanted as a kid was to get published immediately. But I now understand the value of taking the time and, you know, learning and growing because you're going to, the amount of growth that you're going to experience between 12 and 25 is massive. Like, I still have the, that initial draft of Loving Law that I sent off in year seven. And it is woeful. Like, it is, it is like the crudest, rudest thing that anyone has ever put to the page, and it is just disgusting. Like, it is vile. Like, I read it and cringe. And there are some things in Loathing Lola that I've written, I'm like, wow, that got published. But, um, and you're, you're constantly growing. So don't think the be-all and end-all is getting published now. The main thing is develop habits and write because you love it, and then everything else will sort of fit into place. Does anyone have any questions? So what I thought I'd do now is I'd sort of talk a little bit about how I turned, what my process is, how I turned my real life um, into my second book, and then how I sort of came up with that pitch. Because um, again, I pitched, I got through, I got that book deal with a different publisher because of pitch, and um, and it's one of the big lessons is to pick what um, makes you unique and write about that. So for me, there was a lot of resistance. I didn't want to be typecast as the guy who wrote Greek books. And so when it came time to write my second book, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to write about something Australian. I'm going to write about the Outback. 
And, you know, I was, I was adamant I wasn't going to write about being Greek because I didn't want to be the kid whose surname was Kostakis who kept writing about his crazy Greek grandmother. And then, lo and behold, my second book was about my crazy Greek grandmother. But the main reason why that was, was um, I was visiting a school in Brisbane. And because the big thing no one tells you is that you're going to make most of your money as an author from speaking, which is frightening because writing is a very solitary behavior and we're not by nature very loud, outspoken people. We're more, give us a room, some quiet, and a notepad, and that's where we're in our element. And so we end up doing that for a year. And then they sort of push us out into a crowd and they're like, now entertain and dance, monkey dance. And it's really strange because it's, you have to sort of have that flip side and be good at it. So if you are afraid of public speaking or if speaking makes you nervous or if you're scared of you know, sharing, then that is going to make it very hard for you. Because um, So a big part of selling loading Law is me going to schools and talking to kids. And I was going around and... Um, before I speak to a group, I usually ask the teacher what they're like. And teachers are always like, oh, they're such a great bunch of kids. And then you walk in there and they're just about ready to throw feces at you. And, um, <laughs> but before I spoke to the school in Brisbane, they're like, oh, Will, just so you know, um, this is a really rough bunch of girls. And I'm like, if, if they admit that it's a rough bunch of girls and that's call your family and tell them you love them because this is the end. <laughs> and so I walk out and I'm like, oh, but maybe, maybe they're missing out on the subject they hate. Because, you know, if they're missing out on science, they love me more. And so I'm like, oh, what subjects are they missing out on? So he just sighs and goes, lunch and PE. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, no, this is the end. And so I walk out, and it's 200 girls sitting on the floor in their gymnasium. And I have to teach them a class. And I walk out, and they're basically just like... <laughs> and I'm like, uh... And I'm like, I've got to tell them a funny story. I've got to make them like me. And so I'm like, right, what do I talk about? And I have this story I keep in my back pocket to use in case of emergencies, and it's about my grandmother. So, um, my dad did a massive Houdini when I was growing up, and um, it left my mother and my grandmother to raise me alone. And uh, so when it came time for my book launch, I wanted to say thank you to my grandmother. And so I, um, I got, I looked up on YouTube how to write something in Greek, and I sort of, because um, the Greek has this really weird squiggly alphabet, and I wrote a really nice personalised message in the front of my grandmother's book. And so it was like, dear, get yeah, yeah, just Greek for grandmother. Thank you for everything. Lots of love, William. So it wasn't too complicated, but it took me ages. And so I go up to her, and I'm like, and she's like, yes. I'm like, yeah, this is for you. And she's there. If you need a mental image, anyone in here Greek? No? So Greek grandmothers come in one size. So imagine a four-foot-tall sack of potatoes <laughs> dressed head to toe in black, and that's my yeah, Susie. And I'm like, yeah, this is for you. And I hold out the book, and I expect her to like, explode in mirth and just cry. And she's like, no, I do not want it. I'm like, what? She's like, no. I'm like, oh. And I'm feeling really rejected. She's like, no, I will go buy it myself. I'm like, oh, okay. And she leans in and she's like, where do I go buy it? I'm like, yeah, you go to Dimix and you say Will Kostakis. Ah, I'm not stupid. I know your name. <laughs> <laughs> I will go tomorrow. And so the next day she goes to the bookstore. And I get a phone call. And I pick it up and I see this. <laughs> and basically, if you get that phone call from my grandmother, it means one of two things. Either someone has died or someone on the Bolton Beautiful has died. <laughs> Both are equally serious. And um, I'm like, yeah, what is it? What is it? She's like, they don't have it. They don't have your book. And I start feeling, and I'm like, oh, what? They don't have it? I thought I'd be the next JK Rowling, and now Dimmix doesn't have my book. And I hear this lady come up to my grandmother on the other end of the phone, and she's like, how, how may I help you? I'm like, great, she'll help her. And he got turns to her and goes, William Kostakis. And the girl's like, I'm sorry, I don't understand. And my grandmother realizes she needs to elaborate. And so she takes all of the English she's learnt in 60 years in this country and turns to her and goes, William Kostakis. And the girl's like, I'm sorry, I don't know William, and if he works here, he's not working today. And I was like, no, nah, that's it. My grandmother just starts swearing at her. Like, full on. And you're like, oh, that's fine. She doesn't speak any English. But my grandmother, one, everyone knows all of the Greek swear words, especially in Sydney the only time someone will speak to you in Greek will be to swear at you. And two, Greeks tend to swear with their whole bodies. It sort of comes by your, it comes with your proximity to the Mediterranean. So it's like, ah, yeah, yeah. And you can just tell someone's angry at you just by how big their hand movements are. And my grandmother swears with her whole body. Like, she has these moves that she uses. So there's the, um, it's, it's the combination boob slap and you want a dishwasher on a game show move. So let's all pretend that, um, let's all pretend that, say, xylophone is the rudest Greek swear word. So she'd be like, ah, xylophone. Oh, my boob. Um, but 
I can just see the quotes. Oh, that hurt my boob. Will Kostakis. <laughs> Nobel Peace Prize for Literature winner. Um, and so, I'm on the other end of the phone freaking out because there's a short little Greek lady walking into bookstores saying my name twice and then swearing at everybody. This is possibly not the best advertising campaign for my book. And I'm like, yeah, I need you to calm down. I need you to look around and I forget if she can find the picture book section, I can direct her to the young adult section and she can find my book. I'm like, okay, yeah, what, what books do you see? She's like, oh, I don't see any books. I'm like, oh, great. She's at one of those demixes that have like all these different sections. So she's probably like the board game section. I'm like, yeah, where are you? She's like, I'm in the TV section. I'm like, okay, cool, you're in the DVD section. So go downstairs. She's like, no, darling, TV, big TV. <laughs> yeah, yeah, where are you? I'm where you told me to go. Yeah, where was that? I'm not stupid. I know where I am. I'm like, yeah, but, but where are you? I met Dick Smith. <laughs> so save it out for a moment. Short little Greek lady. Among the high def TVs. Swearing at people because they don't know what William Kostakis means. <laughs> and so, I'm like, no, yeah, yeah, Dimix. Oh, why you not say that yesterday? I did say that yesterday. Okay, love you, bye-bye. <laughs> and she hung up and I'm like, oh, okay. Um, and so I told this story to the group of girls that hated me and they just started laughing. I'm like, oh, sweet. So I turn around and I start writing on the board, how to creative write. And I turn back and this girl has her hand up. And she's like, tell us another story about your grandmother. And I'm like, oh, I probably shouldn't. And um, I look to the teacher and the teacher's like, yeah, tell us another one. And I do. And if we have time later, I might tell it. And then um, when I finish, this girl put up her hand and goes, that's exactly like my nonna. And she shared a story about her Italian grandmother. And this other girl put up a hand and goes, that's exactly like my Vietnamese grandfather. And she shared a story. And it got to the point where the period finished 40 minutes later. We'd done no creative writing and all we'd done was make fun of our families. <laughs> and I sat back and I thought, okay, whatever just happened in this room, I need to capture it in the book. And so on my way home, I call mom. I'm like, mom, I'm not coming home. I'm going to stay with the young for a bit and just follow her around and write a book about it. I was like, okay, that's a bit creepy. I'm like, okay, don't worry. And so I do, and I follow you around. And um, day five, we end up going to a store called Spotlight. Are you familiar with Spotlight? <laughs> so it's a and so I go in, I follow you, and I'm like, oh, what's going to happen? And she walks in, and I sit back, and this guy's standing there, and he goes, like, hello, darling. And he's like, hi, how may I help you? She's like, darling, I would like high quality shits. <laughs> and the guy's like, I'm sorry, what? And she's like, oh. He's stupid, so I have to say slower and louder. <laughs> Darling, high quality shit. <laughs> and you can just tell the guy really wants to say, Have you tried fiber? Like, <laughs> and I'm like, Okay, right. So I start writing that. So I go home and I start writing the book. And I get about four or five pages in and I realised this book is just my grandmother walking into different stores and either swearing on purpose or swearing by accident. That's not enough. And I always say when you're turning your real life into something that's fictional, you take your real life and you ask what if. And so I thought, okay, so my first book was I wanted to make fun of my fancy private school in Sydney. So I was like, what if we had a TV show? So I said, I thought, okay, what's my what if question for my grandmother? And the first one that hit me was what if you're ya fought crime. And so I imagine like CSI Rockdale, a short little Greek lady wandering around with two bazookas going, why are you not date my grandson? <laughs> so it was a hilarious mental image, but it wasn't realistic. And I, after my first book, I wanted to write something that felt more realistic. And the big thing is, if you want to write a story that's realistic and intimate, you take your real life and you take the characters and you ask, what are their biggest fears? And then you make them face those fears. And this happens whether you're writing fantasy, whether you're writing romance, that's always a good place to start because a character facing their fears is such a powerful arc. And so I said, oh, okay, my grandmother, what's my big grandmother fear? And so that was an easy one. My grandmother has been such a huge part of my life for so long that my big fear is that one day she's no longer going to be around. And unlike a fear like jumping out of a plane and my parachute not working, this is a fear that will very definitely come true. Like it is an un unavoidable you know, part of life. I thought, okay, I'll write about that. It's really deep. I'll win all these awards. <laughs> and so I started writing it. And I got about two lines in. And I'm like, this is the most depressing thing in the world. I don't want to write this. And so I thought, okay, how can I talk about those fears but in a fun, humorous way that's true to your spirit? And then it hit me. What if you had a bucket list? So, you know, it's not like 
a white person bucket list, you know, where it's like, oh, let's go to Uluru, or oh, let's go scuba diving, you know. My grandmother's bucket list, you know, if she can't eat it, she doesn't really care. So um, <laughs> her bucket list would be more, I'm going to meddle in everybody's lives. And so I thought, what would be on your guys' bucket list, you know, besides kidnapping George Clooney? And, uh, <laughs> and, you know, you can just imagine it, like, hello, Mr. Clooney, today, today we do ice bucket challenge again. Keep no, um, <laughs> shirt on. No, um, and so... I'm like, okay, what would be it? You know, the first one would be, you know, find your mother or husband. That would be the first point on my grandmother's bucket list, you know. The second point would probably be make your older brother like girls. And um, <laughs> the final point would probably... So I'm like, I'm sitting there going, okay, what would she want to change about me? And I'm like, nothing, because I'm perfect. <laughs> and then the final one would be make your younger brother not a shithead. Because, like, my younger brother, he's like... Ugh. You know, you know when brothers go through teen angst and they don't sort of stop. So it's like, hey, Tom, how are you? Oh, go away! No one understands me. God. <laughs> and so she'd probably want to fix whatever the hell is wrong with him. <laughs> and so I thought, right, that's my story. What if you had a bucket list? So I'm like, wait, no, this is supposed to be a book for teenagers. How can I make that a book for teenagers? And then I was like, oh, what if you gave me that bucket list while I was trying to do my HSC? And that was it. That was my pitch. What if a Greek grandmother gave her grandson? her inappropriate bucket list to complete. And that became the first third. And so, those were... The big thing um, I find that... Um, did anyone here do extension two for year 12? Yeah? One of the big things I find... So, you, in year 12, you can do up to four levels of English, and on the top level of English, you get to write a major work. And whenever I ask kids, you know, what's your story about? And they sit there and they go, oh... It's about the struggle between good and evil, and it's about the dichotomy in Australian society, and it's about really overcoming feminism and finding my voice. I'm sitting there, I'm like, yeah, but what's it about? There's no story there, yeah? So you have to come up with pitching. The big part of pitching is finding a cut-through sentence, just one sentence. If you have, if they call it an elevator pitch. If you can say it between the floors of an elevator, then it's a good enough pitch. So my first book was... What if a group of Sydney teenagers had their own reality TV show? Second book was, what if a crazy Greek grandmother gave her bucket list to her grandson to complete? Yeah? They're not very long pictures. And obviously the story is more complicated than that. But what I'd like to focus on today, I'd like you all to get comfortable pitching your ideas. And, you know, one of the big things when you have someone pitching is like they get up there and you know and I was guilty of this at your age and I'm sure some of you in here with uh, when someone asks oh what's your book about and we're, we're always we're taught by society to be humble and by humble it means to put ourselves down and to doubt ourselves and so it's always like oh you know it's not this good but it's sort of like kind of a love story and I guess it's kind of crap I know but you know and it's about people and they, they sort of fall in love and yeah and then you sort of end up, does anyone do that when they're talking about their pictures? You end up, you, you overcompensate because you don't want to be that, that girl that's like, oh, I'm writing a book and I'm amazing. Like, <laughs> stop it. Do that because if someone's going to invest in your idea, are they going to invest in your idea if you go up there and go, oh, it's not that good, but... No. It's Sit there and act like your story is the greatest thing ever. Right? Because that confidence is infectious. And the big thing with, you know... A publisher has to sit there and go, okay, I'm going to invest money in this person. Notice I say person and not book. They would like you, they're, gonna, they're in it for the long haul. They'd want, if you want to write a book, they want you to write a second book as well. Because the fourth book isn't until they start making the big bucks. So um, what they want, they want a career out of you. And so if you're sitting there and you have no debt, you have doubt in this first idea, they're going to make no money from the first book no matter what. So... You know, why would they risk all that money on someone who doesn't believe in themselves? So, one, I want you to believe yourselves with your pitch. And two, I want you to be concise. I don't want to know about every single character. Like, I've given... ...character dynamics or anything. So don't worry about that sort of stuff. Yeah, don't worry about the backstory. Give it to me in one... Write a paragraph. So write, do it in 50 words. And then try to do it in 40. Then try to do it in 30. Until you can almost do it in 20 words. A pitch, you because that's, that's a pitch that's easier. Because what happens is you pitch to an editor. Then an editor then has to pitch to the marketing team. And the marketing team, once your book comes out, they have to pitch it to a newspaper. And they don't have time to sit there and go, 
oh, you really like this story, but it's really slow. So it sort of starts off in this, you know, eight, in the 1800s, and you've got five characters, but you know, there's only one that's really important, but you won't know that until. Sentences going to have to be repeated time and time again. <coughs> and if the story doesn't have that, no matter how good the story is, it won't be read because you know. Think about the times when you're recommended a book. Yeah, when you're recommended Twilight, someone's not like, "Oh, there's this girl and she lives in Forks," and it, no, they're just like hot vampire sparkly boys. You know, that's it. <laughs> like, that's it. You've got to you've got to distill it down because that's how that's how friends are going to tell others about their book. That's how marketers are going to tell newspapers and TV stations about your book. That's how librarians are going to pass your book on to kids or to adults or to whoever. Way to start that. And if you can't sell your book, how is someone else going to be able to? So what we're going to do now is we're going to break out. Think about your pictures. No. Okay. Well, then, so if you're not work if you're working on something, then pitch that. But if you're not working on something, then I want you to come up with a pitch. Like I want you to think of the most. Like think about what would impress us. Yeah. Think about the story you'd most want to see. Yeah. Because sometimes the way you know, sometimes if you pitch before you've written something, that makes you more excited about writing it. Like if you're ever stuck, if you ever have like. look like so um think about stuff like that and so think of a th if you can't think of a, an idea on the spot think of a short story you've written or ben law was uh, was talking about yesterday and think about you know pitching articles you know is there an article you want to write you know how would you pitch that it's the same sort of thing no one wants a 500 word this is what my article is going to be newspaper, they need to come up with a headline. They need to put that headline either on the front have to click through. So how would you con pictures and I'm gonna come around and help you out and give you positive feedback, yeah? Oh, oh no. Thing for them to so we're setting up the forum now, and you'll be so by all means shoot them through. 